Hello there. Even before this week got started, we got some pretty huge surprise news with the announcement of the War Within's release date, which is August the 22nd for those of you who have purchased the Epic Edition and August the 26th for everyone else. Both of those dates are global releases with the launch time being 3pm Pacific time for folks in North America and 11pm UK time, midnight on the 23rd or 27th for folks in Central European time. These dates were announced in Sunday's Xbox Showcase, which by hindsight should not really have been a surprise. Blizzard have in the past announced expansion release dates during gaming industry events like this. The Xbox event, however, hadn't really even been on my radar until I got an email from Battle.net talking about Blizzard announcements. This was, as you'd expect, quickly followed up on Monday with a burst of announcements for the testing of endgame content on the beta. I'll come back to the specifics of that in a moment, but those announcements also provided some additional information on how the content will roll out when the War Within drops, and I thought it could be useful to try and distill that information down and take a look at what we do know, but also what details are still missing about the overall content rollout for the new expansion. Before the launch of the new expansion, we will, as always, get the pre-patch. Now, like I suspect most people, I had expected that this would not launch until the end of Mock Remix on August the 20th. But with that leaving only two days until the early access, I think it's probably vanishingly unlikely that Blizzard are going to wait that long, especially given the scale of the changes in that pre-patch. The majority of pre-patches have lasted around four weeks, with a few being up to six or even eight weeks. I don't think this pre-patch will justify such a long pre-release, so my guess is that we can expect the pre-patch to drop either on the 23rd or the 30th of July, depending if they go for the four weeks counting from the early access or the delayed access dates. The pre-patch release will include the launch of the Warbands feature with an updated login screen, conversion of most achievements to be account-wide, account-wide dragonflight-only reputations, and a combined account-wide bank. I do plan to do a video on Warbands in just over a week's time from when this video goes live, so if you're not a subscriber, do hit the subscribe icon and the bell icon so that you get notified when that video goes live. This is a massive change for World of Warcraft and you'll not want to miss that update. We're also going to get the launch of Sky Riding, which is a new name for Dragon Riding, but this time you're going to be able to Sky Ride in almost all of your existing flying mounts. So if, like me, you enjoy using a random mount summer, this pre-patch is definitely going to be for you. I've already done a video covering all the key changes to flying and riding in the War Within, which should be linked on screen just now. Along with that, we'll see the launch of some fairly significant class and spec tree updates, albeit the hero talent system will not be accessible until the main expansion. And another thing, guilds are also going to become Gross Realm, which I know will be very useful for those of you who like to play on multiple servers. There will of course be a pre-patch event. This usually starts about halfway through the pre-patch, so I'm going to suspect that this will go live around August the 6th or 13th. Do keep in mind, this is purely speculation on my part. The pre-patch event is called Radiant Echoes and is at least superficially similar to the Dragonflight one that taking place in three old zones, the Swallow Marsh, Dragon White and Searing Gorge. We don't know at this stage if there'll be any storyline content in the pre-patch, but I would personally not rule out the War Within intro story taking place, perhaps in the last week before the early access. Moving on to early access itself on August the 22nd, which is actually going to mean we're getting four days of early access instead of the minimum of three they originally promised, and Blizzard unfortunately have not shared any details about how they think they are going to manage this period beyond promising that it won't give players any advantage over the folks with delayed access. Now, I personally think that it's impossible to deliver on that promise because even just reaching max level four days early is going to increase the odds of you already being at max level when the harder content starts to open. And of course, there is going to be an impact on the gold economy, no matter what Blizzard try to do. My personal advice is that if you haven't yet already decided whether or not to get the Epic Edition for the Early Access, is to wait until Blizzard do share more information so that you at least know what you're going to be getting. 
Full disclosure, I did get the Epic Edition, but this was because as a content creator and an add-on developer, the guaranteed access to the beta was very valuable to me. But setting that aside, this does mean that there will likely be some restrictions on the content during the early access period. Now, my best guess at the moment is that the early access will probably consist of raising the level cap to 80, the leveling campaign and side quests, and the normal leveling dungeons. There are four leveling dungeons which are guaranteed to be open. I guess that they could keep the other further closed, but I don't think that's very likely as four dungeons instead of eight, I don't think really would achieve very much. So my guess is they'll probably keep them open. I'm personally speculating that heroic dungeons won't be available at this stage, but you know, who knows what Blizzard will do. On the open world content side, I do think that there will have to be some max level open world content. I mean, getting to max level and then just having four dungeons would be a pretty terrible introduction to the expansion. So my guess is that we'll likely will have the world quests in at least some of the world events. Now, in Dragonflight, Blizzard did delay the Elemental Storms world events until the first season started, but that really didn't work out, and with the new Delves feature taking up the same space of seasonal content for casual players, I don't think that's so likely to happen here. And of course, there will likely to be some rares, and honestly, if those rares are dropping like decent gear, that's probably where the issue of players getting an advantage will rear its ugly head. Now, moving on to the subject of delves, and we do know that the first two levels of difficulty will be available for leveling. Blizzard have also confirmed the third level will be available pre-season, but it's very hard to say if they'll be making that available during early access or not. One thing I suspect we will not see during early access is the gear upgrade system. In Dragonflight Season 3, we got access to the Weltling and Drake Crests and Flight Stones for the week before the season opened, and in my opinion, that definitely did impact gearing progress. Even as someone with Mythic gear, I was getting some upgrades before the season opened. So my prediction is that the new upgrade currencies, which are known as Valor Stones and Harbinger Crests, will not be available during early access. One question I do have is if the gear drops at this stage will be upgradable or not. Even having gear that you can upgrade once you start getting the currencies, in my opinion, still would give a bit too much of an advantage. So we may find that the gear we get in this phase is not upgradable. And personally, I think that's going to be a bit 50-50 on Blizzard's part. Overall, this is an area where I think we really do need to get some updates for Blizzard. Having people put their money down for a feature without really knowing what it is, isn't really a great situation to be in and I think that is a bit of a black mark in this process for Blizzard. Moving on to the delayed access on the 26th and I'm expecting that Blizzard will follow the pattern of past expansions and delay unlocking any of the new stuff until the weekly reset that week. So for the first day or so of the delayed access I expect things are going to be exactly the same for you as it will be for the early access people. With the weekly reset on the 27th or 28th of August, that's when I expect that we'll get the remaining pre-season content going live. Now, this will likely include the heroic dungeons. Now, one thing to be aware of, on the beta, the dungeon finder, that is queued access to heroic, is marked as not being available until the new season opens, but we can still do the dungeons in pre-made groups. Now, Blizzard have did post an update in Dungeons this week and that made no mention of this limitation so it's possible this won't carry forward to the live game but there is actually a pretty decent chance that it might be pre-made only access in the pre-season period. We'll also likely get the Delves level 3 opening up at this point and the one big question in my mind is what will happen with the upgradable gear and if we'll actually get any upgradable gear until the season opens like we did in that Dragonflight Season 3 or not. Personally, at the moment, I think it's about 50-50, but if they do decide to give it, they might just limit it to the lowest tier, which is the Weathered Harbinger Crests, which is the new equivalent of the Weltlands. But I think that is something, until Blizzard shares more information on that, that, yeah, I think it's anybody's guess, honestly. The Season 1 proper has been announced as starting on September the 11th for North America and 11th for Europe, so yes, I guess there's no global release. This will have all the usual stuff we're used to, but if you're not super familiar with it, 
That will be the new raid, Nereba Palace, in normal and heroic difficulty. But yes, we are going back to the BFA Shadowlands process of having Mythic Raid Daily Access being delayed by another week. This is when we might get the heroic dungeon queues if they were limited pre-season. Mythic Zero dungeons, which Blizzard have confirmed in the dungeon update this week, will not be available pre-season and will also get the delves level 4 to 11 and the secret 13th delve. This means that in September 17th, 18, we'll likely see the release of the Mythic Raid in the LFR Wing 1. Now, Blizzard haven't given us full details of the LFR unlock schedule, but a separate announcement of story mode, and there'll be more of that in a moment, has heavily implied that they will be doing a stage rollout, and in the past, this was every two weeks. On the subject of story mode, this is a new option that enables the final boss of the raid to be done either solo or in a group of up to 10 players with even lower difficulty than LFR. Basically, this is for folks who just want to complete the traditional campaign quest that we get to clear the raid or to see the story to its bitter end. This has been announced as launching with the final LFR wing and assuming three LFR wings, spaced every two weeks, this would be around about the 15th or 16th of, of October. Now, personally, I think that's far too long a wait for that mode, in my view. So hopefully this is something that Blizzard might look at and change. We can just keep our fingers crossed. Now, do keep in mind that there is a decent amount of speculation in this summary. I will, of course, update you when we get more official information from Blizzard on this front. In terms of the big endgame testing announcements, and we got the release of the raid testing schedule, with the first tests having been completed even before this video goes out. As is traditional for Blizzard, the heroic and mythic tests are taking place at very specific dates and times, with the normal and LFR taking place over full weekends. As is often the case, the final boss is not going to be getting any public testing, so I guess Echo and Limit will be doing that for us on the 10th of September. The Mythic Plus testing announcement was accompanied by a major update for the Season 1 dungeons. This recapped some of the Dragonflight Season 4 changes but did introduce a bunch of new information. Starting with Season 1, the Heroic Dungeon Pool is going to mirror that of the Mythic Rotation. That is a mixture of War Within and Older Dungeons. Now, I'm honestly surprised they're also not including this in the pre-season. And I do wonder if this is partly why they are blocking the queuing pre-season, i.e. to avoid a very confusing experience for players who do queue up. For Mythic Zero, as well as also following the seasonal rotation which we were expecting, Mythic Zero is going to be moving from a weekly lockout to a daily one. Now, with Mythic Zero now effectively replacing the old Mythic Plus 2 to Plus 10s which were spammable, I do think this is a reasonable change by Blizzard. The new seasonal dungeon roster was already shared, but it consists of four of the War Within dungeons, that is the Stone Vault, the Dawnbreaker, Arakara, City of Echoes, and City of Threads, and four of the older dungeons, Grim Batal, the Necrotic Weight, Mists of Tirnasai, and Siege of Bralalis. Now those old dungeons are a bit of a spicy list. Siege of Bralalis in particular probably figures in most folks 10 worst dungeons ever, and both Necrotic Weight and Grim Batal also fall into that category, so I do hope that these have some very extensive reworks. On the subject of Siege of Baralis, Blizzard have also confirmed that it's going to be the Alliance variant of the dungeon that will be going live. For those of you who are not aware, the Alliance and Horde versions of the dungeon did have some small differences at the start and at the end. Moving on to Mythic Plus, and the main change is to the affixes. Affixes are now going to kick in at slightly different levels, with plus 2 for Fortified and Tyrannical, plus 4 for a new set of affixes, and plus 7 for Bursting and Bolstering and the other set. The new plus 4 affixes are called Reckless, Thorned, Attuned and Focus. These are all based around a Cursed Kiss system, giving buffs for specific player damage, but also buffs to the damage that ad packs will be doing to us. Now, if you're wondering how these affixes are different to each other, honestly, that was my reaction when I saw it too. But there'll be a bit more about that from me in a minute. The plus seven affix pool is also being pared down to only four. Those four being Raging, Bolstering, Burstering and Sanguine. 
Blizzard have also said that they are still trying to work out how Fortified and Tyrannical will fit into these changes, so I do hope that we might see some changes to those plus two affixes before everything goes live. Now, it's fair to say that these changes have not been well received by the community at all. Blizzard did provide their design goals for the new affixes, describing them as passive and expressing a desire to shift the challenge onto the dungeon and away from the affixes while still offering varied gameplay. Now, I don't think the new affixes really achieve that last goal. In my view, the new affixes feel very samey, with all but one putting the bulk of their impact onto tanks, and all of them likely to hit healers more than any of the other roles. I think that especially for DPS and mainstream keys, they will feel very much the same. At, obviously, at high bleed and edge keys, they may impact routing a little from week to week, but the number of players who push to the extent of noticing that are going to be very small indeed. The one impact that DPS may experience in the pug world is that some weeks they may find it easier to get into a group than others. Now, weird ass gatekeeping is an issue in Mythic Plus, of course, but personally, I don't think these will be impactful enough for that to become a major issue. At least, we can certainly keep our fingers crossed in that. For tanks and healers, the impact of these new affixes is going to be multiplied by the way that the remaining plus 7 affixes are all focused their impacts on tanks and healers. Add Tyrannico into the mix, and well, one thing that DPS are going to feel, I suspect, is that the current shortage of healers is only going to continue, except this time tanks are going to become just as hard to find. Overall, I am glad to see the removal of Afflicted, Incorporeal and Spiteful, but in my view, the new affix set disproportionately impacts healers and tanks, and it fails to deliver any meaningful changes in feel from week to week. The difference in which players get the DPS buff is quickly going to become more of an annoyance instead of a benefit. Blizzard have always struggled to find ways to make the affixes add to rather than detract from the experience of Mythic Plus, and this proposal is no difference, and in my view it would make the experience of Mythic Plus worse overall. I do hope that Blizzard rethink this proposal in the short term and in the longer term take a long hard look at if affixes can ever manage to meet their desired design goals. With so many misses in this front, in my opinion, the evidence that the use of affixes is completely flawed is starting to pile up. But what do you think about these changes? Are you as glad as I am to see the back of Afflicted and Incorporeal? Do you think that the new affixes will make it harder for us to get groups for DPS players? Or do you just want Blizzard to stop affixes altogether? Let me know in the comments down below. Finally, and we also got an update for the new endgame mode, Delves, which is available for testing now on the beta. Much of the information that Blizzard shared had already been shared in interviews, but if you missed any of it, here is a quick recap. Delves have 11 levels of difficulty. Levels 1 and 2 are intended for leveling, and according to Blizzard, level 1 has been aimed at newer players, with level 2 at players who are already doing some kind of seasonal content. Level 3 is intended to be the max level entry level delve, with levels 4 to 11 being the main seasonal progression. The majority of rewards for dwelves are intended to cap out at level 8. This will be heroic raid levels of gear, and interestingly, the new seasonal glory achievement for delves is also going to be achievable at level 8. Levels 9 to 11 are intended to offer a harder because it's their challenge with a steeper progression curve, but with no real increased rewards. Starting from level 4, and Delves will have a death counter, essentially a limited number of lives. But don't worry, if you lose all the lives, you can still go on to complete the Delve, albeit there will be reduced rewards. And in that case, you'll also start to get stacks of an old favourite from LFR, Determination, which will give you a power buff up to make sure that you can eventually get to the end of the delve. Now, I did see some suggestions that we'll need to complete a delve within the death limit to progress onto the next level up. That's not currently the case in the beta, but that also could just be not there to enable testing. So we may need to wait and see if that's going to be the case when it goes live. Certainly Blizzard didn't make any mention of it in their new update. 
As well as the 12 main delves, there's also going to be a secret 13th delve, which consists of a single boss encounter, Zekvir, Hand of the Harbinger. This is intended to be a much harder challenge, similar to the Mage Tower. As it's for all classes and roles, it cannot be quite as tightly tuned as the Mage Tower, but the devs have stated an intent to get it as close as they can to that level. Zekvir will also be the name of the Affix-like system for the level 4 to 11 delves, with groups of enemies being buffed. Now, according to Blizzard, defeating these groups will add more rewards, which to me implies that these might be somewhat optional, but honestly, we don't have a lot of info on that until people really dive into the testing and investigate a little more. Now, I will be doing a preview of delves in a few weeks once I've had a chance to do some in-depth testing for myself, so do look forward to that if you'd like to get some more information in this new game mode. Finally, to round up the testing announcements, and we've got the announcement of the launch of the 11.0 PTR. This will be going live this coming Monday, the 17th of August, and as is traditional, it's going to be used to test the pre-patch event, but none of the major expansion content. For that, you do need to get beta access. Now, in advance of that launch, the PTR Realm is now available for character copy. When the PTR does go live, Blizzard are going to be testing out their new system that will convert all of our achievements and Dragonflight reputations to be fully account-wide, and they've asked us to copy over as many of our characters on the PTR as we can so that we can contribute to that test. In my view, this conversion process is likely to be the most technically risky thing about the War Within launch. Account-wide achievements, and especially their rewards, have been problematic in the past. Just recently, I had issues with the Black Netherwing Drake skin that was a reward from the Dragon Riding Races achievement, for example. Contributing to this test will be a great way to find out how the process will work for you personally, but also to give you an opportunity to report any problems to Blizzard before you experience them for real on the live game and it will also help to make the experience better on live for all of us, so I do encourage you to participate. I'll include links to the Blizzard post with more info both in the test and also how to get set up for PTR testing below. Just don't expect a smooth login when that test goes live. Tests like this are intended to find issues, not to offer a polished gameplay experience. Anyways, there is, believe it or not, just one small smidgen of news outside of the War Within testing. If you're someone who has been finding the gear upgrade costs and mop remix just a bit too high, then it's good news for you. Blizzard have now doubled the amount of bronze from the bronze caches and tripled the amount of threads from the spools of Eternal Thread. This was accompanied by a buff of 700%. Yes, you heard that right, 700 for the Emperor Shaohao reputation. All but three of the mop reputations, August Celestials, Kirintor Offensive, Sunreaver's Onslaught, and Shaohao, had been significantly buffed from live at launch. And with Shaohao now being the slowest mop rep grind, I think that this is going to be very welcome for folks who want to complete the campaign in the Timeless Isle, which is gated by reaching honour with this reputation. One final piece of news is a little bit bittersweet. John Height, Vice President and General Manager of the Warcraft franchise has decided to move on from Blizzard and also on from at least the development side of the Warcraft universe. John has worked for Blizzard for over 12 years, including as executive producer of World of Warcraft during Shadowlands, before being promoted to the General Manager role and taking up responsibility for the overall franchise. John has a lengthy career in video game development, even before joining Blizzard, having worked in over 30 video games in total. John's own announcement didn't expand on the reasons for his decision. With the recent very positive improvements we've seen to World of Warcraft under his leadership, I for one expect that he will be missed, and I do wish him well in his future endeavours. Well, that's all for this week's major news. It's fair to say that the pace of new developments in The War Within have seriously picked up with the release date announcement. With endgame testing already underway, I suspect there's going to be loads more important discoveries to come in the near future, so do make sure to subscribe so that you don't miss out any of my updates. If you found this update interesting, do let me know by hitting that like icon. That's all for now. 
Thanks for watching.